It's been a while since I've done any kind of video review. I'm feeling masochistic, so bring on the Christploitation. Second Glance is a 1992 Christian movie directed by Rich Cristiano and starring the guy who co-founded Pure Flix. You know, that same company who brought us such films as Straw Man Atheist Bullies Christian, Straw Man Lawyers Don't Understand Law, and my personal favorite, Fifty Shades of Mental Abuse. Second Glance is the story of Dan Burgess, a teenager who's frustrated by his less Christian peers getting what he sees as all the glory, as well as the girl he wants to bang. In his frustration, Dan wishes he'd never become a Christian and gets his wish. In other words, it's a wonderful life, but with a horny Christian teenager. Dan's wonderful journey starts with a cold open that features music that's kind of like the musical version of that 30 Rock meme that's gone around. How do you do, fellow kids? Yeah, that one. Before the opening credits, we get a look at Dan's home life, where his sister pranks him and teases him about his crush on a girl named Tamara, his dad prods into said crush, and Dan lamenting about his nice guy status, since Tamara's got a thing for Doug, one of the school's tough guy bullies. At school, Dan's frustration only grows as his first attempt at asking Tamara out ends with Doug and his buddy butting in on Dan's action. Because Dan can't say, hey, do you mind? I was trying to ask her something. Also, I'm getting the sense of the whole nice guys finish last vibe going on here. Yeah, they made a short film about that once. Spoiler alert, it doesn't end well. No, seriously, go find that movie on iTunes or wherever and give it a watch. It's damn good. Of course, Dan's only other recourse is... Stalking and creepily staring at Tamara when she's not looking. Dude, no wonder that snob fellow put that creepy music over you. Haven't you discovered masturbation yet, or writing your feelings down in a journal? It also doesn't help that one of his teachers teases him about his lust for Tamara. It is my lady, oh it is my love, oh that she knew she were. Hey Miss Fiona. And, because this was likely written by someone who was likely a perpetual high school reject who never dealt with his issues, Dan's ignoring his friend who has an actual crush on him. I like nice guys. Naturally, this thread culminates in Tamara rejecting him with the I don't want to ruin our friendship line. Again, unresolved issues. During all of this, we also see this frustration take its toll on how Dan interacts with his FCA group, with Bull, the dude who looks like he could be Dan's uncle, and with Scotty, a kid who Dan's been mentoring. Here's the thing though, Dan's not bad at giving out advice. It's inferred he consistently gets Bull to calm down after talking to him about how jealousy doesn't make a relationship work, he's mentoring Scotty who's bright-eyed and eager to learn about the Bible, and he's the head of his school's FCA which shows that Dan has some leadership skills. Look, I know it's difficult to have the responsibilities he has, but holy fuck, Dan needs to lighten the hell up! Just because you're not getting the hot chick who's only banging the confident bully doesn't mean you're not having a positive impact on others. And while I'm thinking about it, just because you're a Christian, even a hardcore one, doesn't mean you can't go to parties. Just don't drink the alcohol or do any of the other stuff. In my experience, yeah, you may get a little light ribbing, but they'll mostly understand. His frustrations reach their peak when he's accused of helping Tamara cheat on a test even though all he did was innocently pick up a piece of paper that hit him and fell on the floor. Even Tamara's pissed at him. And even if it wasn't obvious that Dan isn't trying to cheat, you'd think his teacher would be willing to take Dan's character into account and listen to him. But nope, automatic suspension for cheating. He vents to his dad, then right before he falls asleep, he wishes that he had never become a Christian. Dan wakes up to find that his room in his entire house is messy and deserted. Holy shit, Jenny really went all out this morning. Wedding outside is Muriel, who informs Dan that his life is now as though he'd never become a Christian. Dan naturally doesn't buy it, even though the bullies are suddenly more chummy with him, and Tamara kisses him. Which of course, we don't see, because kissing is so scandalous, y'all! This feels like an episode of Quantum Leap where Sam leaps into a Christian drama protagonist, and I was like, nope, I'm out, and leaving Sam to fend for himself. You know, Muriel, if you're gonna pop this on a guy, why not give him some background information? Like how his best friend Ricky's in the hospital because Bull beat the shit out of him for talking to his girlfriend Melanie. Or how his teacher is working as a waiter because alternate Dan and the bullies chased him off. Or, I don't know, how his parents divorced and never conceived his sister. Seriously, Muriel, you could have been a little bit more helpful in that regard. But Dan rolls with it because he's getting what he wants. Respect, two girls who are putting out for him, and a shiny new car he won from his betting on football games. Wait, what? Yeah! It turns out, because Dan wasn't a Christian, he got sucked into gambling. Because Christians never gamble, right? It's not like Christians never gamble by playing, I don't know, bingo or something. I don't think you think of a gambling as a chance you take. That's the same thing. Anyway, all of those positive impactful things I mentioned earlier, yeah, all that never happened because Dan was never a Christian. Because apparently, everyone else was too apathetic to do anything about all of that. And, just to remind you, his sister was erased from the timeline! Look, I know siblings fight a lot, but at least they have a pang of bad feeling when one of them is erased from time! But never mind that, it's party time! Party time, it's party time, everybody's feeling fine cause it's party time! 
Okay, no, 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 no. Not in this video. The party looks pretty standard, actually. Just a bunch of teens hanging out, drinking some booze. A typical high school party. Cue the drama bomb. You better start to face the fact that Danny's mine and you're out. Now just a minute. Listen, Mel, I don't want you to come near him again. You got that. Well, I can't stop doing that to him because I'm pregnant. Because alternate Dan doesn't see the need for a goddamn condom, apparently, and Tamara doesn't believe in non-monogamy, so she gets pissed and breaks it off with Dan. Okay, so it turns out Melanie's not really pregnant, she just wants Dan all to herself, which leads Dan to reject her in order to try and patch things up with Tamara. But when Dan realizes that in this timeline, Scotty killed himself because Dan wasn't there for him, he realizes that this isn't the way he really wants things to be. You know, you'd think his own sister being erased from time would have been a clue, but nope, Dan was too busy thinking about getting his dick wet and then ending up in the middle of a love triangle because screw ethical non-monogamy polyamory, am I right? Meanwhile, Melanie does what everybody does when rejected by a guy using you to cheat on his now ex-girlfriend. Call your violently jealous boyfriend and sick him on the guy who rejected you! Because that makes sense! Bull chases Dan around and just when you think he's gonna see a beatdown, God decides to choose that moment to switch Dan back to his own reality. Because that makes sense! And then Muriel comes back and sums up the lesson Dan's supposed to have learned. That was a very unwise request you made, Daniel, wishing you were a non-believer. And because God's apparently a huge dick, he assigned an angel to him that's about as helpful as a cat with a clap. But Gama, he did tell him stuff. Yeah, sometimes after the fact. Look, if you're gonna do this whole deal, wouldn't it be better to fill Dan in before plopping him into this new timeline? Or at least let Muriel tag along and whisper notes into his ear? And, I don't know, maybe provide some goddamn proof that Muriel's a goddamn angel? Hell, there's even biblical precedent for things like that. Gideon, he wanted to be sure if it was God talking to him, so he did the test with a piece of wool. Look it up, it's in Judges. I know you have an attraction for Tamara, but the Lord holds relationships most sacred, and it grieves him when his children take them so liberally. <sighs> this is a film that presumably, is meant to be watched by Christians to help teach a good moral message. The whole idea of one person making a difference in the lives of his community is a good, albeit simple, message. But where it loses me is when Muriel starts talking about how a Christian relationship should be. The purpose of a relationship is to find a lifelong companion, Daniel, someone to marry. Let me ask you, are you ready to be married? Well, not yet. I mean, I, I want to go to college first, you know, or maybe get a job. And you're not ready for the relationship. Bullshit! What I'm gathering from this is that, according to this film, you should only be with one person ever in your life, and only when you're ready to get married. None of this dating or premarital sex bullshit. Wouldn't it be great, Daniel, to spend your life with a person who is untouched by anyone else? Oh, and your intended has to be a virgin, which is something Dan even wants. Like, dude, the girls in your school want the same goddamn thing as you. Sure, you could hold out for that one girl who's never seen a penis outside of a health class, but even for 1992, you're likely to be a 40-year-old virgin before you find one. And that's not to say they don't exist, because they obviously do. At least two of the girlfriends I've had in my life were virgins when I met them. But when you set your own expectations so high, the fall's gonna hurt. A lot. And some people don't take that fall very well. At the end of the day, the amount of sexual experience your partner has had does not mean jack shit. I don't care if she worked in porn for 10 years, it does not matter. What matters is that you find someone, be it one person or several, that you can connect with and spend some meaningful time with inside and outside the bedroom. By the way, I know this has nothing to do with the plot, but why does Muriel smile like he's either trying to sell Dan a dilapidated timeshare or convince Dan to let him masticate its head? Muriel gives Dan some encouragement and even reveals that Doug secretly studies the Bible, which gives Dan the courage to do this. I know we don't see eye to eye and everything, but just do me this one favor one time. Come on, give the film a chance. I ain't got the time. Make the time. He dirty Harry's the invitation into Doug's face. Because that makes sense! And hey, Dan even gets a smooch from the girl who actually has a crush on him. The movie ends with Dan's reunion with a very confused Scotty, leading into the moment that spawned an internet meme. Hey, Scotty. Jesus, man. So that's Second Glance. And boy howdy is this one both infuriating and face palmingly awkward all at once. 
I won't reiterate my issues on how the writer obviously let his residual bitterness from never being able to get laid in high school lead him to write a spiel in an attempt to make future generations as miserable as he was, but I will say this, for all of the negativity that scene alone brings, I can point out a positive. Yes, one person can make a positive difference in someone's life, even a whole community. This film puts a Christian spin on it, but that message in particular can apply to so much more than that, whether you're Christian or otherwise. And that's not a bad message, it's uplifting even. It's just a shame that this is buried in a film that's got a horrible message on relationships and a protagonist that starts out like one of those forever alone assholes just because he doesn't get the girl he initially wants. If you want to watch it, it's probably somewhere on YouTube. That's all for this one, folks. Until next time, this is Gomer the Ranting Thespian, signing off.